G'day you mob, Pete here, and this is another episode of Aussie English, the number one place for anyone and everyone wanting to learn Australian English. So, today I have a GOSS episode for you where I sit down with my old man, my father, Ian Smithson, and we talk about the week's news, whether locally down under here in Australia or (laughs) non-locally overseas in other parts of the world, okay? And we sometimes also talk about whatever comes to mind, right? If we can think of something interesting to share with you guys related to us or Australia, we also talk about that in the GOSS. So, these episodes are specifically designed to try and give you content about many different topics where we're obviously speaking in English and there are multiple people having a natural and spontaneous conversation in English. So, it is particularly good to improve your listening skills. In order to complement that though, I really recommend that you join the podcast membership or the academy membership at aussieenglish.com.au where you will get access to the full transcripts of these episodes, the PDFs, the downloads, and you can also use the online PDF reader to read and listen at the same time, okay? So, if you really, really want to improve your listening skills fast, Get the transcript, listen and read at the same time, keep practicing, and that is the quickest way to level up your English. Anyway, I've been rabbiting on a bit. I've been talking a bit. Let's just get into this episode, guys. Smack the bird and let's get into it. (laughs) Fight to get to the dunny. (laughs) Dunny keep, race. keep that one in the episode, Dad. So, we, we're both holding out. We need a pee, but we really badly want to get through some of these episodes. Yeah, we've got some good <laughs> shit here. So. All right. All right. You, you just already dropping F-bombs and I S-bombs. No S-bombs. S-bombs. That was an S-bomb. I didn't, you yeah. go for it, Dad. Right. You go for it. Um, yeah, we've done a few. Hang on. Hang on. Random click. Oh, this is my good story of the year. Unleash the So, this the is fury. the puppies and kittens story of the year. <laughs> And unfortunately, it's not Australian. I look really hard. We've done a lot of Australian sort of, yeah, wildlife recovery stories. You'd find nothing positive about Australia. <laughs> oh, no, no. I find nothing to beat this story. All right, all right. Um, and this one is so good that the animal in question actually has been given a name. You're setting it up. You're I know, it up I know. Pretty, it is so good. Pretty up A there. little saw wet owl. Saw wet owls are tiny little owls in America. And they see a lot of wet? Uh, <laughs> W-H-E-T. Um and I, we won't waste time trying to describe what a saw wet owl is, um, <laughs> other than the fact that it's a small owl. There was a um, very large Christmas tree that was taken from upstate New York, so northern part of New York. Traditionally, they would cut down this very large Christmas tree and transport it to Manhattan, uh, into the centre of the city of New York, to have it as a public Christmas tree. Mm-hmm. And this little owl- <laughs> Was in the tree. I think at I the saw time. the image of this, and and this is like a month ago, and and it survived the trip, and then was discovered when it got to Manhattan, oh, okay. and they have just released it back into the wild. Poor little dude, uh, this little guy. And there's if you just check it out, check. It, and his name is Rockefeller. Um, it's a pretty cute the, little bird. Yeah, it's in a beanie. Are, they are serious, and yeah, Big it's eyes. got in this little beanie because obviously it's the middle of winter, mm-hmm. and you know, so it is. That's one of the great <laughs> stories. Like the we fuck? we get, and, and it reminded me of to Australianize this because I figured, well, <laughs> this is my favourite story, you know, puppies and kittens story for the year. But to Australianize it, we get lots of those stowaway animals coming to the south of Australia, particularly yep. in banana crops. Frogs, yeah, spiders. green tree frogs, yeah. spiders. Um, you can yeah. see them at Woolies sometimes. Yeah. I, I've heard of stories like where someone's, you know, pulled some bananas apart and they're like, there's a bloody green tree, tree frog, frog in here. Stuck in here. <laughs> Frozen. Yeah. Yeah. The tree was huge, though. This saw wet owl looking it up on here. Yeah, it, trees, was a, it was an actual the tree. tree. Yeah, it was a this, big this ass tree. This tree is more than 20 metres tall. Yeah, for this outside. Is, this is going to be- you know, it's This is not be, in your backyard no, or in your house. And I think it's called- right, I think it was going to the Rockefeller Centre. Um, so, this huge tree that they have. Traditionally, that yeah, they would cut down a tree and they would bring it into the centre of New York <laughs> and they would you know put their decorations, their lights and all that sort of who are mm-hmm. on it. And they found this little owl. So, I reckon that's- the puppies and kittens story of the year that Rockefeller got released back into the wild. Rockefeller. Rocky the Christmas tree owl. Yeah. Stowaway. Stow he away. was hiding in the- hi- how, do you, how do you be a stowaway in your own home? I know. Well, your <laughs> bloody Stow home away. gets taken. And My you, home gets robbed. You transport your home from you know, across the state. I can imagine the poor little dudes up the top, you know, sitting away so and just hears the- 
we just stayed in the train. Like, unbelievable. <laughs> Wasn't yeah. there a story recently a similar story. to that of um, a koala in someone's Christmas tree? There I've was a that, that came up where let's see if I can find this online no, quickly. That one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, what have we got here? Let me open up an actual news story. We'll go to the Guardian. Sorry. Uh, an Adelaide family came home to find their Christmas tree topped with a new furry decoration after a juvenile koala wandered inside their home, climbed up the plastic tree, right. and and sampled the <laughs> the leaves. I reckon that's a bit of hyperbole. I I I don't think he would have actually eaten the leaves. The family immediately called the Adelaide and Hills Koala Rescue, um, but co-founder D. Hearn Helen said the group didn't believe the story at first. After being removed from the tree, the koala was released into the bushland nearby. There you go. There's been a few of those. So that's a bit they? different from being transported in the tree. So uh, yeah. where this koala is obviously just coming and going, oh, I'm going to climb up this thing that looks like a tree. Yeah. Well, we have cats in our place, and that was the reason we didn't have Christmas trees for a long time cats. because at least two of those cats used to climb up the tree. Mm. The, the only attractive baubles in the tree were the ones at the top. So, mm -hmm. they'd get up like, and the whole thing would collapse. So, but we got sick of that. But you did pretty well. When I was growing up, you had a plastic Christmas tree that you'd bring out every year. We do. go out and yeah, cut down a tree a, and put yeah. that in the house. Well, if we'd done that, we probably would have been all right because it would have been heavy enough to cope with a cat climbing it. But- <laughs> Merlin wouldn't have been able to get down. No. This is my old cat who used to climb trees and then and, be like, help. Yeah. And he used to fall out of the help. tree and he'd catch him. So, this ties in, I guess, while we're on animals. There were a few that we can probably- Yeah, we've got a bunch of these we can rip through. Rush through. Um, so, the first one is that a study has come out showing that kangaroos can talk, communicate, mm, communicate. with humans. Did you think that was pretty cool? It is. Yeah, it's an interesting one. But again, it depends. Uh, the cynic in me just says, <laughs> yeah, all animals can communicate because, you know- uh, a lizard, <laughs> you know, you go and you get a blue tongue lizard, which has got the brain the size of half a pea, yeah. um, crossing the road. And you go to pick it up and it turns around, opens its mouth, flicks its big blue tongue it out, right out and, and hisses at you. Yeah. It's communicating pretty well. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, the story here, Dr. Alexandra Green from University of Sydney and Dr. Alan McElligott from the Sydney University of Hong Kong made this study, put this study together to see if kangaroos could intentionally, intentionally communicate with humans. So, they got 16 kangaroos that were used to human presence from different wildlife parks and they put them through these training trials where they effectively gave them a carrot inside of a plastic Tupperware container with it, where it was open, let the kangaroo eat the carrot with the person standing nearby. And then on the seventh trial, they closed the see-through Tupperware container with the carrot in it and saw what the Here's kangaroo it. would do. And the kangaroo was, was at first, you know, clawing around um, trying to open this thing and then effectively looked at the person, looked back at the um, <laughs> the container and was like, dude, what's up? Take yeah. the lid off. And then I think in a, in a number of cases, walked over to the human, scratched them, sniffed them and was trying to get their attention to be like, can you please open this goddamn box so I can Ooh. eat the, ca- the uh, carrot? So, I thought that was a really cool um, story. I found it really interesting. And they were saying that understanding cognitive capacity of kangaroos could lead to better care for them in captivity, which I am sure they use to try and get a grant oh, of course for, they would. for this study. Of course they would. But considering and how many enough. kangaroos are in captivity, it's good to know more about yeah. their communication skills. Interesting. The only uh, the one you sent me, and that was the only real story that I could find, came from the BBC. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the next one was the giant- um, Marima? Maremas. Maremas. This yeah. is See, this is a problem with English, guys. A lot of the time, we don't know where the emphasis is in these new words. Yeah. Well, names. and the word- yeah, Maremas. Maremas are- um, Maremas. They're European sheepdogs, but they're not sheepdogs in terms of herding, but they are there to protect sheep. They, they're they big white dogs, and they- They look them, like sheep. They look like sheep. <laughs> they don't eat and grass. No. you got to feed and them they don't they eat sheep. They don't eat sheep. <laughs> they just uh, hang out. And so, they just- They basically hang out. So, they, they used- in uh, European shepherds use them to protect the animals from wolves and foxes, traditionally. Yeah. Uh, they've been used in Australia. One of the great stories is using them in Australia to protect uh, penguins on a little island. What was the movie um, called? Um, Oddball. Oddball. Which is the name of the dog. The dog was called Oddball and it was which island in Warrnambool? Middle Island. Middle Island. We recently went to Warrnambool. Which- Anybody in Warrnambool who's it's watching this, very tiny. can you please explain to me why it is called Middle Island? Because there are two little islands in a row, 
off the mainland. And you can walk to this <laughs> island at low tide. There are two little islands off the mainland. There's the first island and then there's Middle Island. <laughs> Are you seeing the problem here? They're There's trolling. no third island. They're probably I, like, we'll call the left one Middle yeah, Island. Yeah, I know, just to, know, just to mess with your head. <laughs> Where's the third which, one? Which apparently has worked. The Unicorn Island. Yeah. So, so they put these. Sorry, they put these uh, Marima dogs out on on that island. On that island. The one to, on the left. Yeah, the one on the left. <laughs> called the middle one island. called the middle uh, to protect the uh, penguins from foxes because when the penguins come into breed. Um, they also, uh, obviously, you've got babies in there. They've got eggs, you've got babies, and then you've got molting adults, and these none are of which can escape. The world's so, smallest penguins, yes. fairy called penguins, little, little penguins, penguins, fairy commonly penguins. Commonly penguins. Penguins. called fairy penguins. And they live in burrows, so that's the problem. They can be yeah. easily dug out easily or dug attacked out and, and eaten. eaten. So, and they can't fly, obviously. So your story. <laughs> so, this quickly. is all lead up to- Go for it. Go. You- oh, you want me to do it? Well, okay. I can. But- Zoos Victoria and University of Tasmania um, put together a program that adopted using these marimas, marimas, marimas. marima dogs to act as guardians. Or for- marimbas, which are sort of you know, Latin musical instruments. <laughs> they just have them tied to them to <laughs> yeah. keep the foxes yeah, away. Exactly. It's not like the dogs don't scare them away. No, it's the marimas. It's stupid. Drums. So, these dogs are being used in a trial to protect um, the endangered eastern barred bandicoot. Which, sorry, little time out. I used to work in the Zoological Board of Victoria as an education officer, and we used to call them Easter barred bandicoots. And there was a big movement to try and get rid of the Easter bunny as the symbol yes. of, of Easter and, and have the but Easter the barred bandicoot. Bilby. But then the Bilby became it, so we gave up the Easter barred bandicoot. Damn, Bilby so. took over. Bilby's a coot, though. Yeah, so, obviously, these eastern barred bandicoots are endangered in Australia and they're predated upon by foxes and cats. Mm-hmm. And so, the thing here was that, effectively, what they did was take um, these marimba, marimba dogs, put them in this area, uh, a natural conservation reserve near Skipton in November- where they released then 20 bandicoots and they effectively had a flock of sheep nearby that had the dogs in them. And they were hoping that these dogs, after having bonded with the sheep and staying in that local area, would keep out other keep pre- predators. And yeah. yeah. And so, I imagine then that the sheep aren't necessarily competing too much with the bandicoots and the dog's presence will keep away these predators. But mm. it was really interesting because bandicoots are these- Really cool kind of like little marsupials. We've got 20 species in Australia. They're about, you know, the size of a small yeah, cat. Everything maybe from smaller. that size to that size. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, they're omnivores. That'll work really well on the podcast, won't it? Yeah, exactly. You won't be able to say anything. Yeah. They can, they're about the size of a small cat, yeah. right? Yeah, Macy, or, yeah. a bit smaller yeah. than your cat, Macy. Yeah. Um, but they're sort of Australia's answer to a very miniature pig, right? Like a teacup pig. Pretty much. Yeah. Bandicoots. Or, or a rabbit. Yeah, except True. they're not just herbivorous. They'll eat all sorts of things. But, yeah, yeah. And they're about rabbit size, which is a good thing. You, hold on, let's see if I can do this. You probably know them. Crash from the the game Crash Bandicoot. Yeah, I am not sure why they decided to use Bandicoot. No, in Crash Bandicoot. No. I don't think it was an Australian and they're not game. Orange. And they don't wear blue shorts, but or run yeah. or do the the spinny they're, thing. They're little hoppy things. So if you know kangaroos, they're not directly related to kangaroos and wallabies, but they're like a little. Tiny little wallaby, so they sort of hop around. Yeah, they're very small, but really cool. And And they're they're, nocturnal. They're tracking them. They tied, I think, or stuck uh, little trackers to the tails of these little bandicoots. And then I think the 20 of them that have been released, they're hoping that they can then track them and see if they survive. But I thought it was a very clever way of, you know, problem solving these kinds of conservation issues where you have to kind of think outside the box. You have to think, okay, well- it's kind of farmland. We're not going to be able to eradicate cats or foxes. We would like these animals to come back. We don't want to have to pay for crazy amounts of infrastructure to fence off these areas. And maybe we can't do that. But what we can do is buy a few dogs, train them to live with these sheep as they would anyway. And then if you've got sheep farmers in the area, you just have mm. the flock there with the dogs. And all you need to do is pay for the dog's food after the fact. Yeah. And hopefully that exactly. leads to it. So- who knows? Maybe the uh, countryside will be dotted with these maremas. Maremas. God damn, that's going to be- I'm big never going to remember. Big white dogs. Big white dogs. Yeah. They're pretty cute. They look like big ass Labradors, right? Yeah. With yeah. like shaggy Yeah, but they're a bit coats. taller and bigger. Yeah. yeah. The last one here related to more Australian marsupials was Uh-oh. bear and the koalas. I oh, yeah. I thought we finish on that. I, I, but, uh, you didn't I, read the article, did you? I, I did. I read the article. I knew <laughs> the story anyway. But I was going to bring the bottle of gin to show people, but I didn't. And you won't have one because it's brand new. Don't. We'll show you next time.
That's it. I've We've got, got a whole, whole bunch. episode on beer and the koala. I've got a whole bunch. I've got all the other gins, every single other gin up here, but not yeah, that one because I didn't one. get it. No. I got two. So, the story is Bear is a working dog that has been trained to detect koalas. And so, the story goes that back in 2016, Bear was this- I think he's a Border Collie cross. Yeah. So, a very active dog that needs a lot of attention. Some people have bought him, put them in their flat or apartment, and he'd effectively torn the place up. (laughs) So, they wanted to give him up for adoption. And uh, this- Detection Dogs for Conservation program ended up searching for these sorts of high energy dogs that were very motivated to be rewarded and do a lot of exercise to take part in this program. Five dogs were chosen and trained up and two of them were trained to sniff out koala poo. And apparently it's because these students, PhD students studying koalas used were after the koala poo. But that they were only 30% sex- successful in finding the koala poo just by, obviously, by eye, not by smell. Whereas the dogs were 100% yes. efficient, at least based on the stats that they were, you know, given to me. And so, that made a big difference in understanding the distribution of koalas. Because, obviously, if, if 70% of the time you're screwing it up and the koalas are actually there and you don't think they're there because you can't find their poo, um, you know, you're going to think they're in fewer places than they really are. So- Bear was trained up to be able to initially help these PhD uh, researchers find koalas to get better data on research. But obviously, in 2018, 19, no, 2019, 2020, that summer, we had all those bushfires and a lot of that, well, it was pretty much all the bushland in Australia, overlapped, funnily enough, with the bushland that koalas lived in and affected a lot of koalas. And so, Bear was trained up and had these little- Cool little um, wearing, shoes on, right? Wearing, boots. Yeah, boots with- To with protect, protect his, feet. his feet from the heat. Yeah, yeah, to run around these areas and find koalas that were injured so that they could be then hopefully rehabilitated and let go again to help the population mm. survive because koalas have obviously been decimated as a result. That leads to the end of this story. I, I saw this come up, I think, back when it was happening early 2020. I got this job recently making whiskey and, and gin at the Ballerine um, Distillery, distillery um, the restaurant of which is called The Whiskery. Go check it out if you're on the Ballerine Peninsula. And they recently did 400, 450 bottles where yeah. all the profits went to Bear and the Koalas to help um, the program for searching detection dogs for conservation, conservation. program. Yeah. yeah. And so, I thought that was a really cool story. Again, thinking outside the box, which is really clever, you know, uh, just we have these highly motivated dogs that we can teach to sniff things out. Yep. And we have this problem of koalas being very difficult to find unless, you know, they're running across the road in front of the car. (laughs) And so, we marry those two things together and you have a happy dog Mm. and hopefully a lot of happy koalas because they get treated for their burns. Well, the best thing about finding- uh, for looking for koalas this way is that koalas tend to stay in a very similar area and they stay in a tree, one tree for a long time. Yep. And so, if you find their poo on the ground, you just look up. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so, yeah, because they're not going to go, oh, I'm going to poo here and then run off three kilometres in that direction. They're, um, they're just pooing out of the tree and dropping it straight where it is. So, you can usually- And it's the old thing of- um, And I've taken, you know-, you know Students out looking for, you know, spotlighting and so on, and you're spotlighting for koalas. And you go, no, no, you look at the ground. Oh, there's a koala poo. Looks well, they got their out. eyes closed. So yeah, you're not exactly. going to see the eyes right in the spotlight. Yeah, so uh, you can always find them by looking for their poo. And it, how does the gin rate, Dad? It is a belter. It's <laughs> really good. <laughs> what makes a good gin? And what is gin? Do you what want to describe gin? that for people oh, here quickly? We go. This is we've gone from <laughs> we've gone from koalas to gin, which there is obviously the segue. Um, at least with gin, this gin. Gin is a, a spirit, an alcohol uh, made um, from you know, plain alcohol spirit, but it is primarily using uh, juniper berries to give it the flavour. You distill it and through and, juniper and berries through or juniper steep berries. juniper berries in yes, it. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, and then that used to be the standard thing. Just you know, take alcohol, distill it with juniper berries in the still, and you whack it at the other end and then you drink it. Um, but most gin distilleries and- producers now create their own little recipe of what they call botanicals, basically plant products, mm-hmm. whether they be juice or seeds or leaves or and so on. And um, they blend those. Um, either 
directly in the distillation process, or they distill them all separately and then blend them together. And here's Teddy and the Fox from yeah, Bellarine so I'm, Distillery. I'm showing um, probably their their first and best yes. known yes. Uh, gin, and it just won another gold, apparently. So, if you can get your hands it's on this- It's a ripping gin. You'll be able to find it if you're yeah. in Victoria, probably in Melbourne or along the Bellarine Peninsula. But, it, you know, it's a hundred bucks for a bottle here. Yeah. And it's a cracker with um, ginger beer. Absolutely yes. love it. Yeah. But, yeah. Or fever tree tonic. And this one, I guess, there, yeah, to talk about it a bit more, this one has orange- Added to it, a lot of which recently I have been responsible yeah. for <laughs> zesting. So, I take the zest off the orange. There's the effectively the orange outside peel. layer of the peel, not yeah. the white not stuff. Not the white, the orange makes bit. It bitter. Yeah. yeah, the orange bit and zest about, I think it's, you know, 125 grams of it. Add in the orange juice. They add alcohol. They distill that. Take that dis- distillation, distill it and add that to the and final that product. In. Yeah. And that's how they get that one. But the koala one, they added lemon myrtle. Lemon myrtle, lemon, which is a eucalypt species. A type of gum tree that, that yeah. koalas may eat. I don't know. No, not, they don't need that not, one. Probably not. Tastes like crap. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tastes like lemons. God yeah. damn it. But it, it adds this beautiful lemon scented you know, flavour mm-hmm. and smell to the gin uh, without potent. adding any citrus to it. So, unlike mm-hmm. Teddy and the Fox, which has got orange in it, yeah. uh, this one smells like lemon, but it's because of the eucalypt. There's a lot of work in getting those balances right, too. Working with Craig Michael, who is the, the head distiller there, uh, my boss when I work there, he puts in a lot of time mm. playing with these recipes and getting it right. One Thanks, of the most Craig. Recent he made one, me a special blend of this one. Yeah, he loved it. <laughs> but I think in that one, too, I, I think it was that one. Could be another one. I'm, I'm still sort of learning about these gins. He toasts a bunch of macadamias. Yes. And then pulls the oils out of those by distilling yeah. through them. And again, that adds in this, this insane sort of flavour. sweetness. So, yeah. It's great. But yeah, it is pretty cool. I like that aspect of um, producing an alcohol where you can do so many different things. There's so many things to So many to variables with. to make the different flavours. Yeah. But we won't go down that rabbit hole. No. Hope you- or hopefully bandicoot you- hole. Oh, bandicoot <laughs> burrow. <laughs> True. <laughs> oh, man. Thanks for joining us, guys. We'll see, see you ya. next time. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Although you're probably going to see or this after the fact. Happy holiday. <laughs> Hope you had a good holiday wherever you were. That's it. See you guys. All righty, you mob. Thank you so much for listening to or watching this episode of The Goss. If you would like to watch the video, if you're currently listening to it and not watching it, you can do so on the Aussie English TV channel on YouTube. This is different from the main channel. You'll be able to subscribe to that. Just search Aussie English TV. TV on YouTube. And if you're watching this and not listening to it, you can check this episode out also on the Aussie English podcast, which you can find via my free Aussie English podcast application on both Android and iPhone. You can download that for free or you can find it via any other good podcast uh, app that you've got on your phone, Spotify, podcast from iTunes, Stitcher, whatever it is. I'm your host, Pete. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a ripper of a day and I will see you next time. Peace.